Some things just go together. Wine and cheese, flowers in springtime, and yes, books and bottles. We pair your favorite author with your favorite drink. Your host of Books and Bottles, Benita Johnson. Welcome to Books and Bottles. I am your host, Benita Johnson. I'm so grateful that you chose us to tune in tonight to our um, wonderful show where we introduce you to authors and we pair their works with your favorite wine or spirit. As we promised, this season was going to be amazing. And so today we have an author with us today who is willing to share his story. The book is called Tabernacle of Lies. So I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Farone P. Wiley. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me here. Ron, thank you so much for being here, Mr. Author, Mr. Life Coach, and Mr. Podcaster. So we're going to get into all of that because we want everybody to support you. So we really appreciate you for being here and most importantly, for sharing your story. So I held up your book a second ago. I'm going to hold it up again. This is the book that um, we're going to start talking about tonight, Tabernacle of Lies, Memoirs of Innocence Lost. So can I just give me a second to read um to our viewers the little bit that you have on the back because it says so much absolutely so, tabernacle of lies is the true story of a black lgbt youth coming to terms with his sexuality while growing up in predominantly suburban white neighborhoods and under the repressive influences and abuses of evangel evangelical Christ christendom love that word it is the first book in a compelling and delightful series, giving you a front row seat to experience tragic secrets, a pursuit of love, and innocence lost amidst the audio social landscapes of the 70s, 80s, 90s, and the heights of the AIDS crisis. So thank you so much for sharing your story because it's still prevalent today. Absolutely. Uh, yes, uh, these are uh, just portions of my life story. Uh, growing up black and gay and under the repressive influences of evangelical Christianity. And uh, I'm also a, a survivor of sexual abuse at the hands of clergy. Uh, and so uh, the, the book kind of uh, details a, a little bit some of the uh, conflicts and hypocrisies that uh, arise when those two worlds uh, uh, collide. I can uh, imagine that. Yeah. So when you let's let's talk first about when you first felt or identified yourself as a gay man or a gay youth, I should say. Well, um, you know, in, in the book, it kind of uh, talks about how uh, in that era, uh, particularly in church environments, you know, you just didn't talk about it. Uh, and so uh, I was uh, I was aware of my differences uh, from a very young age, uh, although I did not have a word for it. Um, I knew that uh, I had attractions for uh, the, the, the same gender. Okay. Um, and I didn't really come, you know, I was pretty much a happy go lucky kid uh, mm -hmm. uh, until uh, I was exposed to, you know, Christianity and, and religion that was telling me that was something wrong with me. So was it like the, the telling you something was wrong? Was that like the fire and brimstone type preaching that if you're not this way, you're going to hell? Uh, yeah, there was that. Uh, and it also, you know, it came uh, from family. It came from, um, you know, th there, there was that that verse, you know, in, in, in Leviticus, you know, uh, I never, I, I had never heard, you know, anything anything that was wrong with me until I was exposed to uh, those ideas. And so I, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, coming up as a kid, uh, 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 of course, those things kind of happened simultaneously. Mm -hmm. uh, I was becoming aware of my sexuality at the same time I was being exposed to uh, religious environments and that, and that kind of uh, teaching. Okay, so from the book, it seems like you were um, 
a big part of this space where your abuser was. It seems like, you know, you were at church a lot. Um, even it was a part of your education. Uh, yeah. Um, so I, I, I went to public schools up in, until about uh, the seventh grade. Okay. And um, uh, that was also right around the time when the you know jerry falwell and the moral majority and all those things were uh you know kind of at the height of their activity and okay. so uh my, my family had kind of bought more into uh christian ideology uh and mom i'm sure was the initiator that decided that she wanted to put me in christian schools and so the church that we went to um uh, happened to operate a school uh, as a part of their uh, um, organization. So okay. I, atten I attended there. So do you feel like, was your mom's decision just based on religion or did you feel like she saw something in you that she's like, okay, let me put him in this church school and it might make him different? I, I don't know if it had anything to do with okay. me particularly because my, you know, she, uh, she sent my sister to Catholic schools as, as well. Okay. Um, and so I, um, I, you know, there was a, there was a whole push to uh, move away from the ideas of humanism. And uh, I think, you know, churches were using a lot of scare tactics back then as well. Uh, you know, uh, and 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 poo-pooing the idea of uh, public schools and what are they teaching your kids? And so yeah. uh, there was that, <laughs> and it's it's crazy because it's sort of like that today. And so yeah, it, <laughs> and that was the challenge for that was the challenge for me. And one of the prompters that 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 helped me to decide to publish uh, is that I began to see all of the connections. Uh, that were happening, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, 2016 through 2020 was was a bad time, you know, for me, and probably for a, a, a lot of people. Uh, but I was beginning to see the the connections between the the people that had raised me and nurtured me, quote unquote, in the faith, were the same ones who were um, allying and, and 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 aligning themselves behind. Uh, 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 45 and um, uh, I had a real hard time you know um, uh, reconciling that and uh, so it was, was, kinda... your, was your challenge like how can you love me and then you're saying this well, yeah, I mean, you 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 raised me to to be, to believe that you know lying and cheating and stealing and all those things were the wrong things to do, and so now you're just lining up lock and step behind someone who is doing all those things, and you're saying it's okay. 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 So there, the, that was that that played into uh, a number of my sentiments about the hypocrisies that I tried to overlook. Okay. Uh, going forward. So before that, before 2016, or before your decision to write Tabernacle of Lies, were you, well, let me go back. When did you decide that your story needed to be told, not in the book, but just publicly, the abuse that you had experienced as a young person? Well, when I started writing Tabernacle of Lies, it, um, was I, I really didn't have being published on my radar. Okay. Uh, I was really just doing the therapeutic part and just kind of uh, writing stuff out, getting it out, and because uh, you know I couldn't afford therapy, so I I was uh, trying to uh, uh, express myself in such a way that would that would help me make sense of some of the choices that I you know uh, had had made. Uh, so I printed out one copy okay. and I let, and I let someone read it and they were like, Oh my God, Oh my God, you got to do something with this. You got to put this out. This is amazing. And so I was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> like several, several years uh, later through a lot of my back and forth, you know, I, I, I became homeless. I went through the, the challenges of addiction um, and I lost all of my electronic copies. Oh, wow. Um, okay. Uh, and so they were, I was really just sending emails to myself and 
uh, either the I had lost the passwords or forgotten and I, I could not access them anymore. But I managed to hold on to that one printed copy. And uh, amazingly, I uh, kept up with it through all of my back and forth. And uh, I came across it about uh, three years ago and it was just in my stuff. And I was like, oh, this is still here. And so that person's voice started ringing in my head. And of course, COVID hit and I was, I was on the precipice of having all of this time on my hands. So I decided that if, you know, I'm 50 years old now, that if I'm going to do something with it, I need to do something with it now. Okay. So now that, you know, this is out there and, um, the, I forgot his name, Scheindler or something, you know, this person is exposed. How were you received or, or how are you received in that religious community? Well, um, the, 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 the book hasn't really spread that far yet. Uh, Pastor Scheindler has, uh, has already passed on. From, okay. Uh, uh, se- several years ago. Uh, uh, and so I, 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 I haven't gotten any, uh, feedback. The book is getting some pretty good reviews. You know, they say, okay. your best, they say your best friends are strangers. So, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 but I haven't, uh, I, I imagine that, um, sh- should, should I, uh, move into that market that, uh, you know, there, there would be some, some, some backlash. Uh, but no, I have, I have, uh, changed all the names to protect the guilty. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, I mean, it'll be some backlash of course, because in you know, a lot of times the church protect, you know, there's a hope of protection over the church, over certain people and certain, um, power systems in the church. But I think, you know, Typically, there's more than one you. There's more than one for wrong, and this could have happened to somebody else. And sometimes it sparks other people to speak out as well. So, was that your idea by telling your story? It would free other people to tell their stories. Well, ultimately, I want to I want to tell the story because I want people to be connected to the idea uh, that it's okay to. Um, first of all, be who you are. Uh, secondly, to, uh, to question, uh, um, the, 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 the things that we have been taught, uh, and that it's that, yes, these situations are probably more prevalent than we want to admit, particularly in, uh, in, in black community, we just, we, 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 we still protecting uncles and, you know, and aunts and, yeah. and, 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 and we don't talk about it. Right. Uh, and the strangest thing about it for me, uh, is that the, while, while sexual abuse is traumatic and those, and, and, and children largely don't understand what's, what's happening. Uh, and I'm not figuring that out until much later in life. Uh, for me, the sex part of it was not the biggest issue. The part of it for me was the hypocrisy and the links that you would go to, to, um, cover this up, to create a different narrative, to make me out to be a liar. Uh, and so, um, and then at the same time, you know, uh, prop yourselves up in pulpits and whatnot and, and set yourselves up as leaders and examples. And so, um, uh, you know, my story takes lots of twists and turns, uh, and, uh, I'm not finished writing it. <laughs> so, uh, these are just the first two books in the series. I'm working on book three now, and I anticipate there'll be four or five books in the series when I'm done. Okay. And so, um, I'm, we're going to put a pin in it because we're going to bring in our wine expert, but we're going to come back because I want to talk to you about your life, your life coaching and, um, you know, what type of coaching you do and, of course, your podcast. So we have to bring in our fabulous wine expert, Miss um, Kiana Keys of Unpolished Grape. How are you, lady? 
I am fabulous. Thank you so much for including me in this conversation. I've been sitting here listening, just blown Isn't away. It by the story. It's amazing, but you know, we relate. It's relatable, you know, because yes. we understand exactly. You know, if, if you grew up in the church, you know, we understand some of the um, activities that we can all identify as a little bit hypocritical, and it made us question. I, and I'll and I'll and I'll just preface it by saying, I grew up Methodist. And I am now Baptist. My husband is a uh, youth pastor. Okay. At a prominent church here in Chicago. So I I was listening to um, Mr. Wiley's story, and I'm just like, yeah, I I, I get that. I, yes. I understand that, and I I understand I understand how some of these how some of these things work in the church. So I really I greatly respect your story and the courage that it took to write your book. And I think you Thank have you. to to keep talking i think that's very important absolutely keep talking so what are we drinking today kiana i let's see i have um pinot noir from wimallet valley in oregon and i thought long and hard about what i wanted to drink today i did uh read a little bit about mr wiley's book and I, i recently wrote a blog where i pair wine with mood instead of food and oh, I wrote about mood? how M O O D mood instead of food. Yeah, okay. like we always talk about pairing with food, but I like to drink wine by itself, and I often pair with mood. And I thought about what did I want to drink while I was listening to his story. And um, the blog that I wrote recently was I, I talked about how when I drink Pinot Noir, I well, well when I have conversations, intellectual conversations, reflective conversation, anything that's heavy, anything that's serious and important, I tend to go for a Pinot Noir. It's a okay. um, it's a very delicate wine, and it's it's what they call a thinking man's or thinking woman's drink. And so that is the wine that I chose today, and I have my long stem glass. Oh, beautiful! Yes. I love your glass. Thank you. So tell us, what is Unpolished Grape? So Unpolished Grape is a online platform. Well, well, so, so two things. My website is an online resource center for wine. And it is geared towards helping those understand wine that may not understand it. And it's, it's, there's a lot of wine snobbery in the industry. There's a lot of, um, I know more than you. I'm just trying to help people understand the basics of wine. I don't want it to be intimidating for people. And my website reflects that basic education. Like uh, I use a lot of pictures to describe the uh, um, the basics of wine. And I, I just, I want everyone to understand it. And I want everyone to feel comfortable talking about it and enjoying it. So I break down lessons and I explain, you know, how grapes are fermented. Uh, where wine comes from, how wine gets its taste, its color, all the different technical and nerdy and scientific aspects of winemaking. I think that's so important because so many people kind of shy away from wine because it could be intimidating, but the intimidating piece is just how it's presented to you. It's just great. It's fermented. You like it or you don't, you know, so it, it shouldn't be intimidating. And I appreciate what you do because you're trying to give it to us in layman's terms and, you know, keeping it real and just helping us to understand what we're drinking. Yes. And that, and that's where the name Unpolished Grape comes from, because as much as I know, I don't know everything. There's so much I don't know. And it can still be intimidating to me, too. So we're all in this together. It's a journey. No one knows everything. And that is I chose the name Unpolished. That's my own humility speaking there to say, I don't know everything. I'm willing to learn. I actually learn a lot from people that don't know because when they ask me questions, I help to explain things and we learn from each other. So um, for me, learning is very mutual and it's um, it happens on both sides. And so I'm a forever learner, which is why I am unpolished right now. So how do, what made you get into the wine space? I've been drinking wine for 20 years, um, most of my adult life. And uh, I would talk about wine to anyone I know. And to be honest with you, one day it just hit me. Like, 
I need to do something with that. Like, I, I really want to, it, it was actually, I just, I didn't want to necessarily monetize it. I just, for my own personal reasons, I wanted to learn more. I wanted to overcome that intimidation factor. I wanted to be able to participate in conversations about wine. And it was for personal reasons. And then I started realizing that in my wine journey and in my courses, I'm actually pretty good at explaining it to other people. So whatever I learned in my classes, I would go home and I would tell my husband, I would tell my parents, anyone that would listen, I would even talk to my kids like, hey, you know, Noir, I mean, um, even though they're underage, but I was, I couldn't stop talking about it. And I realized that I was actually a pretty good educator and a good teacher. And, and so I, um, that's kind of where my journey led me. Um, a very good friend of mine told me, um, when you begin a journey, sometimes it's important not to know where you go, but just to walk. Just, just to walk. Just, just to walk. Yeah. And so go I on. decided, it was very intentional. I decided that in this journey, I was just going to walk and I was going to see what I bumped into and just go with the flow. And that's, that's where I am. I'm just, I don't know where I'm going to be in two or three years, but I'm enjoying educating people and I'm enjoying having these very meaningful conversations. I really appreciate what you're doing. I understand when you talked about talking to your kids, even though they may not be old enough to drink. You know, other cultures, kids drink far younger than they do um, legally here in the United States. And so, you know, when we're having our businesses. To me, it's important. It's like legacy. You know, your kids can pick up what you're doing. Unpolished Grape can live well beyond you. And, and me, and so they could do what we do. So I understand. I had stores, and my kids were in the back of the stores as four and six, you know, as young as four and six, and um, you know, thinking they own the store too. So I commit. Yeah. yeah. So um, can you hang out with us for a little while? I want to continue our conversation with Perone. Absolutely. I'm here, just sipping, swirling, and sipping. Yes. I love <laughs> it. So Perone, life coach. How'd you get into life coaching? Well, if you're uh, not aware that I, I also, you know, my journey took me to serving in the role as a, as a pastor, mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, approximately 10 years. And I, um, have always been, uh, someone who wanted to impact people's lives positively. And so, uh, when I made a decision uh, in 2020 to completely separate myself from religious environments because I realized the damaging effects that traumas were having on me. Uh, I still had this, you know, urgency to want to um, help people. Okay. Uh, and so I uh, pursued the avenue of life coaching uh, because I am, uh, uh, I feel like I have a, a, a unique experience uh, and perspective uh, to offer those who are suffering from um, uh, the, the, the negative impacts of religious uh, uh, trauma syndrome. Uh, and so, yeah, we, I, I have a, uh, a, a step, uh, step by step, uh, 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 a process in which that that helps people uh, engage the critical thinking process. So you and, see a lot of um, people, and I'm, you know, I don't know if young or old, but you see a lot of people now who say, "I'm not religious; I'm spiritual." Um, do you think that's because of church hurt? Uh, I absolutely do, um, and. I will say that in my in, in in my journey, I just I ask I, I, I try to get people give people the courage to ask themselves uh, why do I believe what I believe, and give them the, the courage to kind of ask uh, those questions, kind of re research it out, uh, and we all fall in different places on the spectrum of of belief, and so I am. I am by no means trying to convince people out of their faith. Uh, I, I want them to learn to be okay with where they're at 
and if they feel like they need to make changes, I want to empower them to to uh, to be able to ask the, the important questions. Yeah, and you know, I um I have three kids, and when I was growing up, we were at church every time the doors were open. You know, sometimes Sunday it was three three services. You know, we were constantly at church, and I felt like it was forced. You know, we didn't have a right. choice. You know, I remember um, me and my friends would go out, you know, once we were old enough to go out, but I still had to go to church. So we would come to church on Sunday, still with the red stamp on my hand. We sitting there holding our hands like this because we don't want people to see. We just got from the club. And so when I was raising my kids, I wanted, you know, to teach them, you know, about about God and, you know, the universe. So they had the opportunity to kind of choose their own path because I do believe spirituality and religion is personal and you know you shouldn't be forced like we were you know we had to go whether you wanted to or not and you know and we were just in there you know we me and my cousins would joke when we got baptized we went in sinners and became all wet sinners because we just got baptized because somebody said we had to <laughs> <laughs> well yeah uh, uh and, and part of what i try to uh help parents understand is um I think there's a significant, uh, a, a significantly greater value in teaching kids how to think instead of what to think. Yeah. And and so uh, part of my process is, you know, you know, I, I'll ask people, okay, so uh, what what is what is the verse in the Bible that you are having the most difficulty with? you know, reconciling or understanding. And they, they might, uh, you know, they'll quote something and I'll say, okay, well, let's, let's, let's look at it. Let's look at what it says. And uh, we can even do the etymology on it if you want to. Okay. Uh, and so then the question becomes, if it's not, you know, um, fitting into what we understand as reality, then the question becomes, so why do you believe that? Mm -hmm. uh, one, of, one of the biggest um, verses I had a problem with was the whole one about press down, shaking together, running over, shall men heap into your bosom. And it communicates this idea that God's got you. Mm -hmm. And no matter, you ain't got to worry about nothing. But unless that, Unless that can apply across the board uh, to someone who's starving overseas, yeah, uh, to the you know it it, it has it, it has a very unfortunately Eurocentric um, uh, application. When... Oh, that's a whole that's a whole <laughs> word, and that's a whole <laughs> big conversation about the Eurocentric um, yeah. influence on what right. our belief system is. And so, yeah, I was challenged by that. And and I'm challenged by the, the, the origins of the Bible that we have and how we as Black people came to um, accepting, uh, you know, these ideologies uh, basically through uh, the atrocities of chattel slavery. Uh, yeah. And so... So much so that we, it became a coping mechanism that we tell our kids to believe in God because uh, that would keep us from getting the whip. Yeah, yeah. And so it has become ingrained so much in our culture that to say anything apart from that um, is... Is, it's you know, instant they, they want, damnation, and they want to take afraid. your they want to take your black card back. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you were afraid, you know, to say anything or to speak up with, for anything that didn't make sense. So I, I do relate to that quite a bit. Right. So tell us about your podcast. Okay, so the podcast is is is, is morphing and emerging, and what's the name uh, of it? It's the it, it's called the Worth Wiley Show. Okay. And uh, I, there's a few episodes up there, but they're, they, they, I had, since when COVID hit, all, my whole crew just kind of went in every direction. And I'm not so good at just me and the microphone. So okay. I, I, <laughs> I am learning that skill. And um, so uh, I'm 
bringing people in and I want to, uh, there's, there's a couple of other uh, podcast ideas that I'm working with uh, some individuals. We are working on a show called um, uh, X Preachers of Texas. Oh. And uh, so I'm gathering a couple of uh, uh, former pastors and uh, uh, preachers who have stepped out of the pulpit so we can have some conversations of, in, along the lines of what we were talking about. Yeah, some like, genuine conversations. Yeah. I like that idea. So you keep us posted. We'll, yeah. we'll keep boosting you and um, hopefully help our people listen to you. I thank you so much for being on the show. I hold up your book again, Tabernacle tabernacle of lies and the second book is out i have it it's called californication is that that, that right so Uh we want to encourage you how do folks get your book for rome uh they can visit my website at fwileymedia.com fwileymedia.com okay and click on the books link and it will uh it will link you through over to the amazon page uh, where you can um, order uh, them in print and ebook. Uh, there's also a, a button there on my web page where you can download the audio book uh, for uh, uh, Tabernacle of Lies. I just encourage you, if you want to get the audio book, please get it directly from me because Amazon trying to take over the world if they haven't already. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, so yeah, those those are all available. The uh, the podcast episodes are available there, and also if you're interested in the life coaching, you can just click on the Your Turn Life Coaching link, and it will take you directly to all the information about uh, sessions, which are very affordable. Thank you so much for opening up. Thank you for telling your story in your book, and of course, thank you for being the best part of Books and Bottles. Thank you, thank Kiana. you for letting me come all up in your inbox and get you to be on our show. We really appreciate you. (laughs) Thank you. I've enjoyed being a part of this conversation. Thank you. So to all of our viewers, we appreciate you so much. If there's authors out there you'd like to be a part of Books and Bottles, please email us at info at gbrosprod.com. And so shameless plug, Please go out to Amazon and buy our book, Faith, Failure, Success, Volume 3, Turning Point. The authors will be on the show in a few weeks. So make sure you get the book so you can um, be a part of our experience. Thanks so much again for Ron and Kiana and to our viewers. Until next week, Books and Bottles, we invite you. Cheers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Camped out at home for COVID? Join us, Indie TV where you will see the talk shows, movies, drama, action, and comedy. Be the first and see it first. Sign up now for free at Indie TV.